Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to another National Radio Safety Partnership Program webinar, Talking Mobile Phone Use in Vehicles with Nestle. My name is Jerome Carslake and I manage the NRSUP and its many activities. Uh, so to please find out more, check out our website, uh, register for the newsletter and you can be kept up to date with all the new things that are coming up and about. Uh, today's session, uh, it's going to go for approximately 60 minutes. Uh, we've got plenty of time for discussion and questions which we'll be taking throughout. Uh, and we'll just sort of interject them as they arise and we may also hold some later if Luke's touching on them as well. Uh, we're going to be recording this session today and it'll be shared as always on the NRSUP website as will the uh, PowerPoint. So please go there for, to follow through again. We love to make sure these are as interactive as possible. So please send through your questions. Uh, you can type them into the question box right here. And uh, as we touch on them, we'll ask. We do have a large audience uh, today. So if we don't get to them, um, we'll pass them on to Luke and he may be able to filter through them as later on. And so today, we are very, very lucky to have Luke Bryans joining us. He's going to be sharing his wisdom. Uh, Luke has been someone I've been in interacting with quite a long time now with, through the NRSUP um, and bringing them into the uh, the partnership fold. So I'm looking forward to talking to you about how he actually received unanimous support um, and a bold step of uh, taking mobile phone use into Nestle. Welcome, Luke. Hi, Jerome. Thanks for having me. And for those of you who don't know, Luke is the safety, health and environmental leader um, for Nestle. He's also passionate about uh, change management, uh, safety in a general sense and um, a keen uh, uh, music musician. Oh, I don't know about that, but we'll, I'll take it. We'll yeah, take it. I'll take Throw it. that as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I think we'll pass over to Luke. Welcome, Luke. Thanks, Jerome. Uh, really, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to come and chat to you today about um, driver distraction. And, and thanks to everyone for uh, for taking time out of their day to, to listen today. So distracted driving, uh, it's, it's kind of been a I think a bit of a passion of mine now over the last two to three years um, during my time at Nestle and um, having the opportunity to share that today is you know, is fantastic and I think to kick things off what I wanted to do was I guess just share a, a key moment for myself um, on this journey uh, and it was it was at our sales conference about I think probably about 18 months ago off the top of my head um, filled you know I was in a room you know filled with with sales uh, our sales team uh, sales leaders um, from Australia and New Zealand and um, the moment was kind of I finished our presentation and, and what I was faced with was, was a room with 300 sales employees, deathly silent. Um, you, could, you could literally hear a pin drop and, um, and them staring back at me. And as I looked throughout the room, I could actually see, you know, some tears in some people's eyes. Now, it's obviously not my intention to make people cry when I speak. Um, and hopefully I don't do that today. <laughs> um, but it, it was a really, really powerful moment. And, and the reason I'm highlighting that is, um, you know, anyone who's worked with a sales team, is married to a salesperson or, or knows a salesperson knows that they're you know traditionally full of energy and, and high energy and there's a lot of um, a lot of engagement and to have a room full of those 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 guys and girls you know almost stunned and um, you know a little bit emotional it was a real standout moment for me that that kind of thought actually this is the moment where we've where we've effectively moved the elephant to use a term that I'll I'll unwrap a little bit later so um, very powerful experience for myself and um, and hopefully I can share some of the the journey to that to get to that stage um, and hopefully give um, give you on the on the line something to take away and, and share did you expect that reaction when you presented to them not at all not at all and I think that's probably why it was such a powerful one for me that's that stuck with me and, and I guess one that I why I've one that I've chosen to share today um, because I think yeah we, we, we anticipated this being received in a certain way this this stance and to actually be on the receiving end of a very different response was 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 awesome, but it was also quite quite confronting because it took me a bit by surprise. Yeah, absolutely. So our listeners are in for a good session now. Hopefully so. Hopefully so. So um, I guess a good place to start for for today would be, I guess why we why we embarked on the challenge of, of effectively telling our or asking our staff and our drivers for for Nestle that not to use a mobile phone at all when they drive. Um, and I think you know first and foremost it, it tied really nicely into nestle's i guess company values um you know the, op the opportunity to to contribute positively to the communities that nestle or, or we operate in is is always a um a strong appeal to the business and and this tied in really really quite well to that i think it's it's important to highlight that taking this stance um 
you know, with regards to distracted driving was, was not my, my decision. Um, it was really something that I, you know, that we put to the, the company, put to the leadership um, and with well-informed um, research and information, it was almost a, a, a no brainer for a company that, that looks to create shared value in the, in the markets it operates in. And, and to build on that as well, um, there was a global focus on driver distraction at Nestle. So uh, with, a, with over 300,000 employees, uh, across the globe, um, there was a, a focus from our, you know, from our corporate team in, in Veve to actually make a difference in this space. And um, although that stance wasn't as as cut and dry as you must stop using mobile phones you drive, um, there was a, a definitely call to arms to to act in this space, which we obviously, obviously leveraged. Uh, the second one was, I guess, around um, extending a what's quite a strong safety culture or very strong safety culture in, in our operations. Um, so when I say operations, I mean our factories and our DCs. Uh, you know, we have high risks there from you know, working at height to high hazard tasks, um, you know, confined space, hazard materials, so on and so forth. And it's an area that we traditionally associate safety with um, in, in those factories and, and operational areas. And I think for us to actually apply the same mindset to um, what might be considered a less risky environment in the sales sales area um, was important and it allowed us to, to really extend that focus not only um, in the operational area but actually say you know what you although you're a driver or you're a salesperson for Nestle we adopt the same safety focus that we have in our factories and DCs to you on out in the field. So you really made sure that everyone recognized the vehicles a workplace basically. Yeah absolutely and I think um, I think one one thing that we we kind of identified is that we, we kind of take that for granted sometimes as a, as a mobile sort of sales team sometimes that, you know, driving is just what we do. It's, you know, it's, it's a mechanism to get to our customers and it's a mechanism in which we, we just do every day that, you know, almost without thinking about it to get to a place to do our work. And I think recognizing that road, that sorry, vehicle as a place of work is a really important step of, of the journey. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and the last two, I think go hand in hand. Um, so if I think back to those initial discussions with um, with our senior leadership team and, and our sales director in particular, um, Andrew, who's a particular advocate of this of this stance, he was quite he was quite clear that um, we're doing this for pretty much for one reason and, and one reason only, and that is to keep our people safe. Um, he was he was a big advocate of effectively going above what legal, legally is allowed in Australia, um, and he wants to make sure that we're we're doing this for the right reason and that is 100 percent keeping our people safe so it wasn't around making it difficult for our our sales team to get from a to b or making their working days longer um it was the, it was the right thing to do as a business because we know that if we're asking our our sales employees to um drive and use a mobile phone uh, at the same time regardless of the using a hands-free or not then they're at increased risk of um collision and, and injury so um that fundamentally became the, the backbone of the, of the program, so to speak. Okay, and that kind of, um, I guess, how we went about it. Um, building on that last point around um, it being the right thing to do um, and keeping our people safe, tied really, really well into, if we're gonna tackle this, then we, we recognize that we need to establish a consistent theme. And, and what I mean by that is, this we knew this was gonna be a, a complex area um, and one that was going to be filled with questions and, and we anticipated challenge. And I think recognizing the reason we're doing it, so the why, um, and then and then making that our consistent theme um, was was really, really quite important to, to make progress in this space. So whenever we were faced with um, a communication um, task or speaking to people about this new stance on distracted driving um, or even answering challenging questions, the consistent theme was we're doing this because it's about you getting home to your families each and every day. Now I'm conscious that I'm I'm speaking to a, an audience of you know people interested in road safety, um, and for us that you know that might be you know quite an obvious point, but that wasn't the case for you know for everyone. And I think we had to at every opportunity come back to that consistent theme about this is not about making your job harder or making your day longer. Like I said, it's about you getting home to the people that love you. Um, or you get into your customers um, in a safe way so you can win in the marketplace. But it was fundamentally about you being safe. And we almost had to go into, dare I say it, politician mode to keep bringing it back into that, to that, to that consistent theme, which was, um, was really quite important. And when you, when you said bringing people back home, did you have much of the problems at all? In, like in some states, the commute isn't recognised as, as part of a work journey or anything like that. Was, was there any problems? Did, did people delineate between work and, and the commute? 
no, they didn't. We didn't have any of those scenarios. Um, I think being a salesperson and, and and operating in that field sales space, you you, you kind of work in day starts the moment you leave the leave the front door and you kiss your loved ones goodbye for the day. Um, probably plays a bit more of a role in in our um, other other areas. So people who actually come to an office for for work and, and then commute to the office. But I think the mindset in our in our sales team is that there effectively is not not a commute. Um, I think to you know to draw on that further um if one of our sales teams has a collision on the way to their first customer effectively that could be commuting but mm. we don't look at it as like we look at that as a as a workplace collision so to speak great they're on the job yeah um all right now the, the next part i guess was um was recognizing the context of the challenge and, and what i mean by that is um i guess we could have looked at this in two ways we could have looked at this as a it's a compliance challenge so we, we need to set a new stance set a new policy and then tell people to do it, and 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 then that's that's pretty much it. It's a, it's a compliance issue, it's a compliance challenge. But I think it was it was bigger than that. And I think what we did is we we recognised that the challenge ahead was not a compliance challenge. It was more so a, a behavioural change piece. Um, it was about and, and going further on that. It was about speaking to the hearts and minds of our people. So recognising that um, we can tell them what to do and and hope for the best, but we actually had to adopt a behavioural change approach to this. And um, we actually had to speak to people's hearts and minds and we actually had to try and get them to buy into it, recognizing that's going to give us a greater level of success than perhaps um, in a traditional way, which might be we have a new policy and here it is and and, and you must follow it. So um, I'll touch on that in a, a bit more in the a, in a, in a next slide. Um, but really adopting that behavioral change approach was, was a real pivotal part for us. Um, the next part around identifying the role of leadership, um, you'll... I'm sure many people on this on this call recognise the role of leadership, but we had to. I think we had some. We had to treat our leaders different to what we um, how we treated our you know our staff, so to speak. And what I mean by that is our people managers. We actually had to identify them as key enablers of this policy. Um, we knew that we had to sort of get them on board, um, adopting a behavioural change approach again. Uh, but we knew that they had to they had to own and live this, bring this to life each and every day. Um, and I think recognising that. Um, some of our leaders, and I guess including myself as a safety leader, had to had to be prepared to be vulnerable. Um, I share an example um, of that around my own kind of safety leadership was that I had to be vulnerable and actually say, "Look, I need to change." Um, it wasn't um, until starting this journey that I I sort of had to challenge how I I sort of look at this space, and I don't mind admitting that. I used to ring my family back in the UK when I left the office in, in, in Sydney. It was a great time to catch my, my dad before he went to work and my sister before she started a busy day. Um, and to actually stand up in that, in that room and say, look, I'm, I'm the same. I'm on this journey as well. Um, but you know what? I see the value in it and I'm prepared to change. Um, change the way I, I, I look at this area was, I think, a, a good opportunity to prove that we're all in this together. Um, and that's what we asked of our leaders as well. Um, and we saw some really good examples of that come through, which I'll, I'll happily share as we move through the, through the presentation. Um, we also knew that um, other markets in Nestle had, had adopted this approach. Um, so the UK had adopted the same stance with regards to driver distraction. And although we're, you know, in some um, cases, a very different market, we're also very similar to that. And what that allowed us to do was actually leverage that and say, you know what, um, the UK had done this and, and it's, they're still doing really well um, and it's actually been a huge success there um, and we're also able to leverage some of the um, resources that help them deliver that success and apply them into into our journey as well which i'll share as we move through as well and i think the last point um is, is a really important one is that we we had to be courageous as a business and, and also as leaders um, as i mentioned earlier our slt director um head of sales he probably started this this stance in saying the easy thing would be for us to say, you know what, you can drive um, in Australia legally and use a mobile phone with a Bluetooth or a hands-free kit. Um, so why why should we be any different? And I think once we um, decided to get on this path, we had to you know really be courageous and actually take this challenge head on. Um, appreciating some of those points I've talked about above, but number one, when we were when we were faced with challenges or we were faced with a, a roadblock or something that probably wasn't as anticipated, then we had to remind ourselves that. We, you know, we have to be courageous in this space to to do the right thing for our people and also for other road users in Australia. Okay, so that's how like, how we sort of went about it to start with. And, and what I want to do, I did mention at the start about moving the elephant, and I think this is probably the point in the presentation where 
some people think what's this guy talking about <laughs> but um but what I'm, I'm, what I want to do is just uh just share something that that was really uh an important tool for for me individually but us as we as we move through this journey now I'll be the first to to kind of admit that I'm not the I'm not a behavioral chain expert um so not a psychology expert I've only touched on it briefly through my studies however um I just wanted to share this with you know with a degree, with a disclaimer and obviously the the, the the reference is there, but this book switch um, talks about a behavioral change model that basically became the, you know, one of the, the frameworks in which how we tackled this, this, um, this topic. Um, and I'm going to try my best to explain it, recognizing that I'm not a psychologist and I, and I certainly didn't author the book, um, but it is quite simple. And that's, I think what the, the, you know, the real strength of this, of this model was that once we identified that we were faced with a behavioral change challenge, um, this model allowed us to actually work through that in a, in a semi-structured way um, and actually allowed us to make sure that the initiatives that we were investing in tied into this this model somewhat so um, apologies to those who, who have seen this um, but I guess I'll just recap for, for everyone's benefit but effectively moving the elephant um, is, is creating behavior change and what Dan Chip uh, or sorry Dan Heath and um, his brother talk about Chip Heath in this book is the first step to move the elephant is to direct the rider. So the rider uh, represents the, the rational um, part of our brains, if you like, or our, our um, decision making. And what that means for us is we had to make sure that the people in our organization knew what we were asking of them. OK, so it's the what, if you like, of what we're asking them to do. Um, and if we couldn't do that, then we were never going to be able to succeed in this space. Um, so once we once we talked to our people and made sure that everyone understood what the ask was and what the requirement was and what we were doing, um, the second part was to motivate the elephant. Now, motivating the elephant is, is is an analogy for I guess our emotional um, part of us. So speaking really, like I said earlier, speaking to the hearts and minds of our people. And I think put really simply, it's the why. Okay, so making sure that our people understood why we were doing this, and I guess that comes back to that consistent theme at the start around it's about you getting home to your families each and every day. Um, and I'll, I'll share some of the ways in which we did this as we move through. Um, and once, so once we've directed the rider, we're told what they're expect, what, what we're expecting and what the change is. We've talked to the emotional side and talked about the hearts and minds about why we're doing what we're doing. The really th fun part, I guess, and it's the, it's the part where an organization can really make a difference is we have to shape the path. So we have to make it easy for, people to do what we're asking of them um, and shape the path for them to success effectively. So um, by doing that and ticking those three areas, we can actually lead the elephants and move in the direction we want. Um, and, it, and it really helped us distill each of our initiatives accordingly. So I might do a sense check there, Jerome. No, I think it makes sense. And um, I actually really like the logical sort of approach and how you sort of lay this out. And uh, I, I think it's quite nice and simple. Um, I'd love to know what other sort of people think who are, who are listening online here. And I guess Andrew's got a little question here just asking, look, I guess this would be part of shaping the path. Would be, Was there any form of advertising advice or did you use in-house in expertise to, to guide yourself moving forward when you're engaged? Yeah, what a great question. I think we need to use advertising a bit more in, in safety. Um, in this instance, we didn't. Um, what we did rely on is we, like I mentioned earlier, the UK and, and using other markets that had gone through this journey. Um, we were able to take the best of what they they achieved um, and as I think forward to what we're going to share I guess some of the videos were, were basically adver advertisements they were reasons why you should get on board and um, although we didn't use an advertising agency or a creative agency to help us get on that journey we certainly adopted some of those advertising techniques to win the hearts and minds of our people but I guess being a global organization did you ever copy any things where like oh but we're Aussies we're different <laughs> we like saying that in Australia don't we it's, it's a common one yeah yeah um, <laughs> No, we in the, many many examples of of that in other areas, but in this one, I don't think we did. I think most people kind of appreciated that we we have a, a similar road safety landscape to the UK in, in many respects. Um, and and what we did in that respect as well, we also found other companies that have been on this journey in Australia and said, you know what, you know these companies have got on board and and they're still going from strength to strength. So um, no, we didn't come across too many of them in this instance. Excellent. Cool. Um, so I will, I will just, you know, um, just, just share one other thing. And this is that this, this book has, um, it has implications for, for a lot of what we do in safety. And I think if um, anyone out there is looking for a, you know, for an easy read, a fun read and very case study focused read um, around behavioral change. And I, I would really highly recommend this book for, for those of you listening, if you're interested. 
I don't get any royalties for that plug, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so what do we do? Um, it's, it's probably the, where the rubber hits the road. And um, what I wanted to do is just take you through each of the kind of initiatives we did and, and try and put them in the buckets of the rider, elephant, and shape the path to hopefully, um, I guess, explain the, the model a bit more. So um, no surprises. Um, we had a, a you know a safe driving policy that talked about what our driver distraction rules were. So um, really the fundamental part of the journey, um, I guess, but it was paramount we did that in a clear, succinct way so that everyone who drives for Nestle understands what the what the ask is okay so we're speaking to the rider making sure there's no uncertainty or no um, ambiguity about what is required um, to hopefully get that rider um, moving in the right direction on a similar uh, vein to that we we devised a, a set of frequently asked questions and i don't mind sharing this is one that we lent heavily on um, our uk counterparts for because they've been through that journey already um, and uh, and it was a real nice build on um on the policy but it we actually found that most of the questions that people had were in this in this document and the answers were shaped in a way that again came back to the consistent theme um, and were consistent to what we were communicating to our people but it was just another resource that we could say that if there's any uncertainty or any questions refer to this and then come and speak to us and we found that this was a real strong tool in which people could refer to in their own time um, and actually uh, really understand what was being asked of them which was great and the driver distraction rules. So although it f formed part of our driver policy, we actually distilled them even further. So we took complete, um, you know, took it completely out of the um, the context of the policy as well, um, and just said this really simply is what has been asked of you. So with those three areas, the safe driver policy, having the aspiration, frequently asked questions, trying to really anticipate any challenges or any concerns that our people might have. And then really taking, um, sorry, distilling those driver distraction rules even further. Um, we were confident we kind of tackled the the rider aspect of the behavioural change model. Great, and just a couple of queries have come through just for clarification on the um, safe driver policy here. Stephen's asking, did the safe driver policy reflect all legislative requirements? Absolutely, yep. So I think um, I think at the top of the policy it, it says that all drivers, Nestle, and all drivers will meet. Um, legal requirements whilst on the road. So the aim there of tackling obviously our requirements and our commitment to our employees, but also the responsibility that our drivers have when they're on the road for, for Nestle. Uh, it then talked about, you know, being not being distracted whilst driving. And then we built on that further by pulling out exactly what that means for our people throughout training as well. So the driver distracted rules. Right, and Christopher here goes on, um, did you get import and or buy-in from your employees in the development of the safe driving policy? Yep, absolutely. Really good question. Um, so yeah, so through the through consultation framework at Nestle, um, we when we were devising this, uh, we we sent this via consult via our SHE committees, via our working groups in the field sales um, environment, and also via our leaders as well to to really have input uh, input into the, what the final policy was. Um, on that on that note, we didn't uh, we consulted with our team on the distracted driver rules, um, but there's obviously limited. Uh, deviation on what those rules were in terms of what we what we what we can we we're asking our people to to do effectively. So we were, although the policy the wider policy was up for consultation, when it came down to the distracted driving rules, there was quite a hard line by the business because we knew what our aspirations were about keeping our people safe, um, and we were quite we were quite not strict the wrong word but quite um, clear on what our distracted driver rules were, what you can and can't do. Um, and just out of interest, how does that you mentioned the factory floors? How did that compare with the factory floor side of things? Was it wasn't much of a difference at all? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Uh, it, it kind of tied into that point at the start I mentioned about leveraging the, the focus we have on our on safety in our factories. And I guess one example would be if you go to one of our, our sites, you know, you can't drive a forklift um, and, and use a mobile phone. Um, you can't even walk around on a mobile phone unless you're, you're still um, standing still in our factories. And one of our golden rules as, as a business is that you can't use your mobile phone while walking around. So although... It's a very different environment. There's a nice synergy between what we're asking of our Nestle employees operationally and our sales team, because at the end of the day, we're, we were just we're just one company. We want our people to get home safely at the end of the day. So there's more inconsistency. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. So the elephant, how do we move an elephant? Um, so training and awareness, uh, obviously with most safety initiatives or safety programs, there is a training and awareness element to it. Uh, and I'll, I'll expand on this a bit further, but it was, 
obviously fundamental that we we got in front of our people um, and we told them what what we're asking of them and the why, and we gave dedicated airtime to that um, to increase awareness. What we found is that the actual awareness was probably not where we'd you know where we'd anticipated. Um, I think driver distraction is one of those topics that we that we just we just seem to accept when we're on our roads. Like it's uh, you look across at the lights and you'll see you know most days you'll see someone checking their phone or or talking on it, and it was kind of one of those things that I think our salespeople or our people in my business would you know almost become um, desensitized to and i think through the training and awareness piece we were able to really um highlight what what risk there was to you when you drive and you either text or you use your mobile phone to talk um, and draw awareness to you know the risks out there so that we could then say these are the risks but we don't want you to be exposed to them and this is why we're taking this stance the resources and support uh, part built on the the training and awareness but there was there was a couple of resources um that were really powerful and i'm going to share some of those in, in a second um but in terms of creating that um that emotional buy-in um, and getting our people on board and i guess getting them to stare back at you in a room you know 300 people and and see some tears in some people's eyes but but seeing them just stare back in and almost this belief was was largely due to the resources that we use and um to go back to andrew's question um you know one of those videos which i'll share in a second you know in terms of if you judge a advertising campaign by how it makes you feel this video was the best advertisement i've ever seen i think um in terms of um getting buy-in so the resources was, was a really big part and the last uh one under the elephant piece was was a launch event um so this was this was this was the event i was speaking at um when we launched this and i think what was what was really powerful and it was almost by accident to start with but then as we went through the journey we realized the power of launching this event at an annual sales conference was was a huge success now the reason for that was our sales guys and girls you know fired up for the year here's your big event here's your big conference you know you all come into sydney for for the start of the year and you hear what the fantastic products we've got that are coming out and you know what what's equally as important as our new products and your sales targets and your sales goals is our new stance on safe driving and specifically driver distraction and i think what that did is that gave that a level of importance in line with all the other priorities that our business have has uh, and it basically it basically got helped us get that buy-in and i think the alternative would have been to say here's the year ahead here is your priorities let's go out there and win in the marketplace oh and by the way we're we're, we're asking you not to use your mobile phone um whilst you do that when you drive would have been a very different message so by giving it the launch event and the I guess the attention that we felt it deserved gave a strong message to our people mm. so just on that, how did you know, like question you from Corey and Daniel both aligned, how did you know you had a distracted driving issue and, and how are you men uh, measuring, monitoring success and how they adhere to the safe driving policy? It's a good question. Um, so how do we how do we know we had a distracted driving problem? I guess um, we didn't specifically think we had a, a problem at Nestle, but if we look at Nestle as a subset society, um, we know we knew from some of the research that we were, um, that that we got from overseas and that if you look at Australia research here um, as well, there's no doubt amongst the industry that if you're using your mobile phone, or you're talking to your mobile phone whilst you're driving, you're more distracted. You know, that's, a, that's almost a, a fact now. So by saying to our people and by our managers calling our drivers when they're on the road um, and our drivers speaking using uh, Bluetooth when they're on the road, then we basically, we knew there was a, you know there was a there was a case where our drivers are more distracted than we than we'd like them to be and the flip side of that is that we take that one level deeper we know that our drivers were distracted and therefore at increased risk of not making it home in the day so although we didn't identify a specific problem in in our own business in in australia um we did know that globally uh you know um road deaths are the biggest cause of deaths in, in nestle world um in other markets and if this was a way in which we can make a positive impact to not only address a problem, but actually go above and beyond compliance and actually make a more positive contribution to our own people and road and road safety in Australia, then it was it was kind of a no brainer. Mm. I think the second part of that question was how do we monitor uh, was it how we monitor if people are doing the right thing? Yep. That's a that's a really a, a real challenge for us at the moment. Um in the sense that we decided to tackle this 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 journey, this challenge from a 
get buy-in, uh, get people on the journey and, and adopt a behavioral um, change approach. The alternative would have been a compliance approach and, um, and and checking if people are doing the right thing. Now, we don't check our drivers um, or spot check or um, try and catch our drivers out to see if they're not um, adhering to the policy. Um, all we, what we do do is we do make sure our drivers know that if there is a collision um, or there's been an incident, then we do have the means to check phone records to to um, you know to check if the phone's been being used. But I, I think coming back to that that first point, you know, in, around it being a consistent theme, um, we're trying to focus wholeheartedly on getting people to buy into it and get on board. Um, and I think as we move through the presentation, you'll see that some of those some of the conversations we have with our teams, people were coming to us and saying, well, we don't want to wait to we don't want to wait till the date of 31st of July that we're rolling out with the, you know, in three months time, we want to act now and we want to get on board with this. And I want to share this content with my family as well. So um, yeah, that's how we kind of approach and, it. And just a query from Amy, she says, so you, you've avoided having a fatality at Nestle, luckily? In Australia? Yeah. Yes. Great. And one question here from Julie, how long did it take to go through the consultation, um, I guess, and the implementation process? What sort of time period were you looking at? Yep. Yeah, so from, from when we started, when we first realized we wanted to make a stance in this space, um, our first step was to make a safe driving policy that incorporated this aspiration. Um, that went through a number of iterations through consultation, roughly around two to three months in terms of, um, in terms of how that looked. And then once we had a, a safe driving policy that was at draft stage, that went out to the wider business um, for consultation for another sort of four to, four to five weeks. Hmm. And one last question from uh, Vanessa before we move on. Uh, are you prepared to share your safe driving policy and distracted driving rules? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, they're, they're on a few slides time, so we'll come Excellent. back to that in a second. Preempting nicely. <laughs> okay. Um, and then in terms of shaping the path, so coming back to the model, um, I, I mentioned earlier how important leadership was in this journey. Uh, and by identifying our people leaders and actually briefing them ahead of the change and involving them in the consultation process. What that allowed us to do is actually put them ahead of the, the change and actually be change agents for us as opposed to being, you know, part of the part of the change. They were able to own that and and help us with that journey, which was which is really powerful. And also recognizing that our people leaders had a, a specific role to play in in this journey. Um, for example, they weren't able to expect their teams to be able to answer their phone immediately you know so if we're asking our people not to use their phone when they're driving our people leaders had to reset expectations so although you know uh, someone might not answer their phone immediately the expectation is that they ring me back within an hour for instance or, or you know to use one example so um, again involving them in a the process was really really critical and then another one was flexible working um, and I will touch on this a bit more in, in a second but what we found was that um, to as an actual enabler for this policy, we actually had to be flexible in how we um, in how we worked at Nestle. Now, I guess by coincidence, but it, it wasn't something that we drove um, specifically. But at the same time, Nestle was transitioning to a more flexible working approach, um, you know, agile working to use another term. And without that change, it would have been really hard for us to um, to, to make traction with this policy. Um, we have people in our business that are required to dial into Europe, um, you know five six o'clock in the in in the afternoon um and a lot of people in our business were taking those calls as they left the office so um you know leaving the office at five taking a teleconference with germany until six get home make dinner at 6 30. um but we had to re we had to flip that and say that it's okay if you to leave the office early get yourself home by five o'clock take the phone call and then you, you can obviously meet your family commitments as well so um that's just one example but the flexible working piece was a huge enabler for us um, to be able to say that we we believe in this policy. Um, we're doing it for the right reasons of getting you home safely to your family. And one way in which we're enabling that is, is for a flexible working policy, which which really helped. Was it very flexible beforehand at all? Not as flexible. Um, I think it, it Nestle also identified that we were moving towards a, a more flexible work environment and wanted to offer that to our to our people. Um, what, what we have today compared to what it was prior to the policy, yeah, quite quite different. Um, you know, much better now in terms of being able to offer a bit of work-life balance to people and actually helping people for their, their other responsibilities as well. So. 
And, and what, on the sales people, what's some of the measures? Is it, is, it, is it around number of calls? Is it around number of visits? What's their performance measures and did that impact on this at all? Um, so they're, I'm not an expert on sales KPIs, um, but they do have a planned planned call route. So um, one thing in which you're able to do is 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 plan our, our sales people's route out for the day, so they know where they're going. Um, they're not um, they're not necessarily uh, KPI'd on number of visits. Um, if I one of our one of our learnings from the the process was one of our leaders. She she said to her team when briefing them on this policy was that you're paid to be in front of our customers. You're paid to um, to win in the marketplace by building relationships and being in front of our customers. You're not paid to make sales over the phone while you're driving over Harbour Bridge or while you're driving to a customer. We want you to get to your customer and do what you do really well, which is win and, and build relationships and get our products out there. Um, so much so that we don't want you to take risks while you're getting there. So there was no, there was no conflicting KPIs um, during this process, which right. is an important consideration, for sure. Uh, and that touches quite nicely on the, the leadership part. So um, the people leader briefing and also recognizing the leaders um, that can really bring this to life was um, was a really important part to shape the path. So by by ticking those those, those areas, um, it really sort of helped our people achieve success um, and made sure there weren't any conflicts in what we're asking them to do and what we're actually shaping them to do when we're out there as a as a business as well. Okay, uh, so what, I was, what I'll do is I'll just share some, um, I think going back to one of the questions, uh, share some of the, the, the resources we, we presented or we used, um, some of these from the UK, some of these from other markets. Uh, but I, I mentioned at this, uh, in an earlier slide that we, not everyone appreciated how much distraction had an impact. And I think um, to speak to the hearts and minds or to move the elephant, you know, whatever noise you use, um, we had to sign it, kind of convince people that there was a problem here. Um, and there was a risk and we don't want you to be exposed to that risk. So this one on the slides, um, again, not rocket science, um, but quite powerful in the sense that people didn't realize how much more likely you are to have a collision um, doing some of these activities. And that sign on the right, um, I mean, every time I've probably seen that sign quite a few times now and I still struggle to read um, the two things at the same time. So uh, that kind of became our, a little bit of a, um, a logo for the program, if you like. Um, but this is just a real snippet of how we how we sort of went out there and just spoke to people and said that there is a real risk here. And um, once people realize that, they actually actually realize, that, well, I don't want to drive um, and be distracted. I actually get why Nestle are doing this, and I, and I think it's a good thing. Okay, in terms of what we asked, we asked of people, um, I think this goes back to um, the lady's question earlier. So this was, this was what we communicated. And again, there's nothing on here that is particularly um, out there, it's, it's quite straightforward. I won't read it word for word, but it basically, it basically is what you'd expect from a policy saying that we don't want you to be distracted when you're driving. Um, and it was, there was no real challenge to this. It was just like, this is what we're asking um, and we're gonna do what we can as a business to support you in that process. Um, and we hope you, you sort of come on board as, as we move through it. Jerome, this, this content will be shared. Yep, it'll always be available afterwards so everyone can go through and see it. And I think um, one of the interesting things on, on the driver policy as well in the stats you had up earlier, um, I think a lot of people don't sort of realise when you're actually driving as well, if you, if you get very emotional behind the wheel, um, your risk is tenfold. So um, there's been no research on the compounding effect, say on the mobile phone, you're having a pretty crank, because you can see some pretty animated people in the car at times when you look around, having some bad calls. So. Um, you think about the moment you get excited behind the wheel, um, you can get tunnel vision with, with as your adrenaline goes up, all these other sort of factors can happen as well. So um, it, it's a difficult one, people get down the road and how you actually make that case on them. It is, and I th we actually kind of tied into that a little bit with some of the conversations we had and some of the training around the opportunity to, when you're driving between customer calls, for instance, and, and not feeling like you have to be on the, on, on the phone to your manager or to a customer, actually allowed you to be a bit more mindful and actually take a bit of time out and, and reflect on your call or um, reflect on your next call or just be in the moment. And I think, um, yeah, that, that kind of popped itself up through discussions with, um, with from within the teams when they said, you know what, this is how we can use this time to actually to actually show that we're being mindful and that we're not stressed and we're, you know, not at risk through that, through that aspect as well. I like that, a bit of mindfulness. Do they, how, cause I know salespeople, as you mentioned, they go, 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 miles, 100 miles an hour. How did they take that? Yeah, it was it was a kind of mixed response in that, in the sense that they are 100 miles, you know, 100 miles an hour. But I think that 
one term that stuck with me is um, that my my manager talks about a lot is what interests my boss interests the hell out of me. And once we had our leaders owning this process and then saying it's actually okay not to be on the phone rushing from call to call, it's actually okay to listen to a podcast or um, listen to some music and be a bit more mindful about how your day is looking. Um, was actually a, a bit of a welcome relief in the sense that we're we're so busy as a society. Uh, rushing from call to call, from conversation to conversation, the team started to realize that actually, yeah, I can actually take a bit of time for myself and, and compose myself between calls um, or um, just just be a bit less stressed as I'm, as I'm going throughout my day, which was a, it wasn't the aim of the policy and it wasn't the aim of the stance, but it was a nice kind of added benefit, I think. Jeez, you can almost see a bit of a, a sales works podcast club. Like, instead of the old, old old book club sort of things, they get in, they, they you might have a topic you throw out and these guys digest it. I wonder what they'll be looking at. <laughs> I'll ask them. Okay, so that was the policy. Um, oops, sorry, just jumping around a bit. In terms of some further um, resource and support, so these, these are just real um, sort of snippets from our um, intranet and our safe driving page. You can see a couple of examples there under the, the res safe driver resources that I talked about. So this driver distraction and FAQs, some of our driver re wider driver safety resources and our safe driving policy. Um, I'll touch on the on, a, on the video that you can see there in a second. Um, but one of the examples uh, that we did share with our teams, and it's on that page, is is the Bluetooth um, or the Do Not Disturbs Bluetooth setting on an, on an iPhone now. I'm conscious many people on the line might know about this, but um, I was actually at a conference this morning and a road safety conference and, and there was someone I was chatting to who didn't know about this. So I guess if there's one positive to come from from this webinar um, and, and you take this away and you didn't know about it, then that, that's only a good thing. So um, this is a fantastic uh, feature, I guess, on an iPhone that not all our people knew about um, and I didn't know about until um, until it was brought to my attention. Uh, for those who don't know, it's, it's really simply when you're driving and your phone links into Bluetooth on your on your hands free, uh, it actually sets your phone to do not disturb, um, which is which is great. You won't receive any phone calls or text messages. But what's really good is that it, it actually texts back to people who've called you or or text you and says, um, "Look, I'm driving at the moment. Uh, I'll give you a call when I get to my destination safely." Um, and there is a feature if someone replies with urgent um, to that, then they will actually get through for obviously emergencies and whatnot. So this was a really good uh, a really good tool for us in the sense that um obviously it helped shape the path it helped people do the right thing and, and, and do what we're asking of them the other thing i guess from a leader perspective so whether myself as a safety leader um, or some of our leaders in the business being champions of this policy is it actually allowed them to visibly support the program uh you know as a leader so if someone texts or someone called um one of our leaders when they were driving then they you get this back and and what we actually found was there's a bit of a ripple effect so um, someone would get a text message back and going, oh, well, that person's, um, you know, obviously got this do not disturb. What's that? Or oh, actually, I'm going to do that. And it and it kind of rippled throughout the, the business. And I guess if there's if there's one thing that you could, I guess you can do, listen to this call, and if you don't already, is is recognise that if we if we do this, then every person that rings you or texts you when you're driving gets this response. There's a chance they might adopt the same mm. approach. And yeah, who knows? We might be part of a bigger change. So. Um, if you don't know about it, it's a bit hard to implement. And Stephen just makes the point here that Android Android Auto does a similar function, and Scott says the same thing. Samsung phones have also um, have the do not disturb function as well. They've had it for many years, actually. So um, if you have those two items, those mobile phones, you can use it there as well. That's awesome to hear. And I was I was actually asked that question this morning, and, and didn't fully know the answer to that. So um, that's uh, got it now. That's great. Here. Thanks for sharing. Um, whilst we're on that, talking about the technology. Have you looked at any other sort of like blocking technologies to enforce your policy or mon monitoring technology in phones? Just a question here from Julia. Uh, not at this stage with the, with the wide audience. Um, myself and, and a team of um, our fleet safety team are exploring um, some technology around at the moment that doesn't allow the phone to be used whilst driving um, and also um, flags if there's been an attempt uh, in terms of what your score is and, and around a coaching approach, but we haven't implemented anything around that yet. Um, but that's not to say that that's the, the next logical step, for sure. I just wanted to call out, um, just going back to the earlier point on the on the uh, do not disturb feature is how I, how I mentioned there's a ripple effect and how you know you, you don't know if if you do it that someone else might get on board. And I want to share a real a real example um, for that for me was this is a screenshot from from a friend of mine who's um, a close friend and and notoriously a shall we say a petrol head um, in terms of you know loves his driving and. Um, I was almost 
bowled over the other day when I uh, when I got this message back from him, and um, I texted him a few times and, and never got it back over the last uh, three four years. And to actually get this back was 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 a bit eye opening. But I actually asked him, you know, tell me about that. I didn't know you you use that feature, and and he said, well, you know, I I know you're a bit of a road safety advocate and I've got that message back from you before and I, I think I saw an article in the paper reminding me about it and I thought you know what why do I not why do I talk and um when I'm driving and I think that just shows the power of you know that you can actually have one of people if you adopt um this and I think uh yeah it's a bit more open for me and hopefully you're not the only example now for a lay person what's a capo <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's that's probably what everyone's thinking, aren't they? What's the actual conversation, <laughs> not not the uh, automatic response you can see. Real real quickly, it was a, a, a capo is a, a device you put on your on your guitar. And my friend and um, my friend Dave and I were playing a gig that night, and he stole my capo, so if I couldn't play the guitar in the right key, and and it, and also I realised we didn't have an extension need to um, to plug our amp into. So if you got on them, that would be great. <laughs> That's great. And whilst we're talking on music here, Ron asks a question. Are drivers allowed to listen to music as long as they don't touch any of the controls on their phone whilst driving? Yeah, it's a good question. And and yeah, we, we don't have a we have a don't have a stance where people can't listen to music. In fact, it was one of the questions that we, we got asked is um is if you're asking people to not use their phone to talk to people when they're on when they're driving, how's that A, how's that different to talking to someone who's in the seat and b how is that different to being distracted by a podcast or music or music which are really good really good questions and i guess the the key quote there is what we said to our people was when you're speaking to someone on a mobile phone um whilst driving it's a it's an interaction that re relies on, on really only one sense and that's hearing and, and talking um so if if you're driving along and, and something happens in front of you whether it be a car pull out or there's been a collision and you and your focus turns to that there'll be a silence on the call but that person is still expecting you to respond. So it's whereas someone in the car would actually see that, and I think unless they're you know, not concentrating or, or not seeing it, they would not expect you to be talking. So a conversation in 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 the car is very different to a conversation on the phone, is what we, is is how we we shared that. Um, and likewise, um, listening to a podcast or listening to music in 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 the phone is a is a one way interaction. You're taking in information, you're not providing or you're not engaging. So um, yeah, we actually. That's the stance we took. The, the other I think, uh, bit I'd add to that as well is like you imagine if you're a work colleague, I've called you, Luke, out on the road and they're going along and you're involved with an incident and I've initiated that phone call and I hear it all happen and then I've got to live with that. Horrific. Exactly. The impacts that can have is, is broad. Absolutely. Okay, so I think, I guess on, on that note, um, one of the one of the resources I really want to call out and again, recognising that there are people on the call that may have seen these resources before and so you like the do not disturb feature as well um but for anyone who hasn't seen this video i think and i want to credit this as as a huge part of of our journey and, and getting people to buy in um to to why we're doing this and if you haven't seen it it's um i'm not going to show it today because i don't trust technology but um it's on it YouTube. does slow things down a bit it on videos <laughs> never show a video in a presentation <laughs> um i would uh, if you haven't seen it i would encourage you to, to check it out uh, really quickly, it's um, it's a group of young people talking about why they text and why they use their phone whilst they drive. Um, and at the end of the at the end of the um, video, they're confronted with a um, a victim of road trauma um, due to distraction. And it, and it really brings home, I guess, you know, some some quite it's quite confronting. This is why we do what we do um, when we're driving distracted. And I think um, by showing that video at the conference I mentioned at the very start of the presentation um, really helped us get that buy-in and, and I think someone said to me afterwards you have to be a, a, a special kind of person and not in a good way to watch this video and still want to go out there and drive distracted it's so, very powerful it's, and I think it's at and is, is yeah the US yeah. Um, and it is a, it gets, gets you out it's not shock but it's, it draws on that emotional link which we're seeing a lot of campaigns which we're being very effective at doing it did and and I can I can see it now and, and I can feel it in terms of the room after mm. watching this video there was an utter silence it was um really powerful and I, i've watched this video many a times and and every time you watch it it's still as impactful so um for those of you out there looking to embark on this journey or just want to try and um help younger drivers understand the risks out there it really speaks to younger drivers with the with the um the message it, it portrays so really good great work from from the guys at at in terms of best practices uh so the next few slides i'm just gonna um quickly share some of the I guess the content from our training um, and again recognizing that 
what we were talking about was not rocket science. And I know I've used that term a few times, but it, it really was um, simple easy advice that people could kind of use and, and take and, and work with um, to get on board with what we we're asking them. So these are just some examples. Um, some of them don't need any explanation, but one I will call out was, was talking to your customers about the changes and why we're making this decision. So when we, when we rolled this out, we recognized that some of our customers are used to calling our sales team and, and then being on, um, you know, contactable most, most of the times of the day. And, when we rolled this out, we didn't say, right, here's the policy and tomorrow you can't use your mobile phone. We said, this is coming. Okay, this is coming in, in uh, three months time. What we want you to try and do now is start to think as teams, start to think about you as individuals, about how you're going to get on board and what you can do to cha make changes to your day to um, remove the distraction from your from your working day. And one of those was talking to your customers about, about um, our policy and that you might not be able to be contacted every minute of every day. And I think some of our sales teams were... Uh, a bit apprehensive of having that conversation, expecting maybe a you know a small um, a bit of backlash in in some instances. But what they actually found was that our customers were like, okay, well, I, I get I get why you're doing that, and actually that's a really good decision to make, and that's a really good policy because everyone you know most of our customers are all road users or they've all got someone on the road or um, you know a, a child who's just starting to drive, and they, everyone recognised that you know what not driving distracted um, is actually okay. Um, so that was a real that was a real um, positive from from approaching it that way. Um, and the other ones around putting your phone in the boot. I know many of our sales teams do that. Sorry, our sales um, team members do that. Um, and we also said to, uh, really obvious point, but call before you drive. Um, it worked before there was time times when they were mobiles. And we've got a workforce at Nestle of you know, some of our sales team have been with us 25, 30 years, so they certainly remembered that that point. And the next one was around um, recognizing, again, going back to that context of the, of the challenge at the very start, I think was recognizing that this was a, a new way to work. Um, and we made a conscious decision not to say, this is what we're doing, um, and tomorrow you can't use your mobile phone. Um, we actually called out and said, look, for some of you in, you know, that are on this journey, it's, a, it's an addiction cycle, just like um, you know, many other things. And by giving people a bit of a lead up period to when the policy became effective, um, was allowed them to Gave them the best chance of succeeding, I guess. Um, so we encourage them, our teams to get together, talk about you know how they can get on board, um, and actually share good examples. So we had one person on our team who has a very long drive in regional New South Wales, and I remember him posting or emailing to his team um, of ten others um, that then went effectively viral in Nestle, saying, "Look, if I can drive you know from A to B in regional New South Wales and not use my phone, then I think we all can." Um, and, and then we started to saw that bit of ownership of, of people really running with it and, and making it their own, which was really good. Just going to touch on the, the flexibility piece I mentioned earlier. Um, so I think I did I did call it out and just say it was a key enabler, but I think it's it's one that we we probably underestimate to start with. Um, and we by having this policy running alongside actually allow people to rearrange their working day, um, and it also encourage managers to to reset expectations with their teams so you know not expecting employees to be in the office you know uh, nine to five every day um actually saying to their team it's okay if you don't answer your phone just give me a call back in the next half an hour or next hour or so we also found that um it was common practice in our teams for monthly or sorry weekly huddles to happen on a monday morning and um again that was a that, that kind of led led our team to sort of maybe dial in if they were driving so teams re Re, um, reset that expectation around when their weekly huddles would happen at a time that everyone was was agreed they wouldn't need to be on the road for. Again, making sure that, oh, sorry, hoping that people then would um would you know would be able to dial in from home before they started, or at the end of their day um, as well. So, a bit of a call out there, and just the last last couple of slides um, from me or last slide from me was. One thing that resonates for myself, you know, being going through this journey was was not underestimating our people. What we what we found was really really powerful was people stood up to the plate and and the safety leaders were popping up throughout our business, you know, where at least where we would least expect it. Um, we had we had a, our field sales manager speak in front of the, her team, saying, I shared it earlier, but saying, look, when did we have the most dangerous job in a company you know when did that happen you know we traditionally think of high risk environments being in a factory or a dc like i mentioned earlier but now if we get it wrong or if we um make a mistake you know the the, the, 
the consequences can be catastrophic for us as field based staff. Um, so this is just one way in which we can help reduce that risk to you. Um, and what was really powerful was those leaders were actually saying, and if you're not on board, then you know what, maybe Nestle is not the right place for you because this is how seriously we value you and we value safety of our people. And that wasn't a, a scripted coached message that we put into the, the mouths of our sales leaders. They were kind of making it their own and, and sharing those, those, those insights as well, which is really powerful. Um, again, one thing that was, was almost a surprise was that we thought people would, would really embrace and need that three month leading period. Whereas some, some of our teams are coming up saying, I don't want to, I don't want to wait till July 31. I want to get on board now. Um, I want the, I want our team to do it now. Um, because what you showed us and, and the journey you brought us on, there's no reason to wait. It's clearly the right thing to do. And it's something that I want to do for um, my family um, and all road users, which again was probably something I didn't expect personally. Um, but I think it comes back to not underestimating your people once you really speak to those hearts and minds. Um, that you know, That's the power of what, what we can do. And to build on that, that point there was um, people want to extend it to their family and friends. Um, the video, the it can wait video, or the hashtag it can wait as it was commonly known in Nestle. Um, you know, that's a, such a powerful resource to share with not only people at work, but the people you care most about um, and really creating change in those people as well. Um, which again is, it, it doesn't matter if you're a Nestle employee or you're a family um, member of a Nestle employee, or if you're just another road user in Australia, it's still still a life. And if we can make a positive impact in that space with some of the resources, then then we jump to the opportunity. And, and we'll share that link um, to everyone as part of the email out afterwards. Cool. Um, and just one other one other uh, analogy or story I'll leave with you was was what we expected to be a, a real challenge um, and you know some some backlash on um, was summed up in this this one story I heard from our sales team and and sales team member in New South Wales. He said he was at a barbecue um, and someone asked him you know how's work going and he said yeah you know it's it's okay it's good yep. Um, Nestle have just told us that we can't use our mobile mobile phones whilst we're driving and the person he was chatting to he said oh that's that sucks that that sounds like a right pain. And his response was, uh, no, actually, it's it's really good, um, I think. They realized that by using a mobile phone, we're at increased risk, and they don't want us to be at that increased risk. So I think it's really good that I work for a company that's not prepared to put us at risk like that. And I think for me, that kind of brought it all full circle and, and, and kind of when I take a step back and realize that, you know, that's why we did it, and that's that's why the business got on board with it. And, yeah, it's a nice story to finish off on. So. It is. You've had... Um... That's a nice conversation piece. So I've got a pile of questions, so I'll get through as many as I can in the last few minutes, if that's all right. Um, what's the medium age of your sales team, just out of interest? I don't know off the top of my head. I don't know. Um, I would I would say, um, actually, I'm just going to part that. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Andrew. Um, question here from, uh, where is it, Daniel? Funding-wise, do you have sort of an indicative figure of how much it sort of it costs you to develop a sort of campaign and uh, manage, and, and how you made the case to management? Yeah, uh, it it didn't actually cost. There was no capital expenditure for us in terms of we didn't have to engage an agency, like I said earlier. Um, in terms, of, there was obviously hidden costs in terms of um, time to for consultation, time to develop the policy, and time to take people off the road to train them at, at their sales conference, for instance. Um, but in terms of was it a safety program that we had to invest in, like in create content um, and resources? No, because most of the resources are out there that we could just leverage from other markets or that was already um, out and about in the, in the media. That's great. So um, Apple Watches, a uh, question from Ven uh, Vanessa. Much of an issue around them at all? It's uh, a great connect question, Vanessa. Um, we haven't at the moment, no. Um, I guess looking at our policy around um, saying that you must not do anything that would you would be distracted, um, that would distract you whilst you're driving, it would be captured by that. But I think... It's such a good question. It's something we probably need to look at, to be honest. Yeah. Question on data: Have you been seeing an instance or change in uh, reduction since since you've done the rollout? So this rollout was part of a, a wider safety strategy, if you like, road safety strategy. Um, we have we've seen a significant reduction in our collision rate in the last eighteen months, um, but I don't have any data that can specifically call out and say that is due to distracted driver reduction. And what sort of what happens if someone's caught using a mobile phone? Question from Stephen. Yeah. So running alongside this, there would be uh, we, we use a I guess a fair and just culture, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, so there's no hard and hard and fast rule on what happens. It's case by case. Um, but there is a disciplinary process and a, a, a an action that follows if if someone is caught. So a consequence framework. Yeah. Yeah. 
Our last question here from Jody: How do supervisors respond to not being able to contact staff on the road? And would you have advice for construction sites where a lot of them use uh, machinery rely on two-way radio communication as well as operating? Cool. Uh, so first part of the question, our sales team um, just got on board from the start. Again, when saying that this is uh, the stance we're taking and this is a way you're going to have to change your, the way you work your teams. Um, once they recognized the, the why, they were happy to deliver the what, so to speak. So that was it. Um, in terms of the construction site, uh, it's not an area that I've, you know, I've, I've got too much experience in, um, and I wouldn't know the level of distraction in that area. Um, but I think that the, the same model would apply in terms of if we, if we know people are distracted when they're talking, um, are our people talking for? Is it necessary for them to talk? If it isn't, then let's stop that. And if it is, then let's make sure that's done in a in a scenario where they're not um, operating high risk machinery or at risk. Basically, like it's not an area I'm too familiar with, but the, hopefully the frameworks I've shown today and the um, the elephant might be able to help with that challenge that you have. Excellent. Well, we've run out of time. I know we still have some other questions, so I, I do apologise for not getting to them, everyone. Um, would you like to leave one sort of message to the audience on, on uh, what we've just discussed? Yeah, can I leave two? One, two. <laughs> one would be if you don't already use the Apple Do Not Disturb or Android or Samsung, then just recognise the power that can have on people that you communicate with or might text you. Um, and the other part is is share the resources share that video with people you care about because it, it can make a difference between them getting home and uh, safely in the day and something casual happening great i might just squeeze one little one in this is quite easy um brendan just wants to know has sales improved or not i think it's a pretty interesting question from your side i'll have to ask the sales director i can't answer that one at the moment um we'll see let's hope so because that's always <laughs> company, right? so, awesome thank you everyone for your time today thank you very much to luke for sharing um, we our next webinar next month is with SPX Protection uh, around how they actually use telematics to influence their safety management systems of their organisation. And uh, as always, thank you all to our audience for the fantastic questions you've filtered through. So I hope you can join us again in the future. Thank you very much.